and we will simply see the resources being shifted to Ukraine gradually withering. Uh, and Ukraine, therefore, coming slowly and reluctantly, uh, Ukrainian leaders having to come slowly and reluctantly to the realization that they have been indeed deceived and abandoned by the West. But I think that that's, one, the most likely outcome and um, the one that I think uh, is currently being prepared for public consumption in the West. Let's now, in the second part of this interview, talk about uh, about possible solutions, because you pointed out in the first part that the cost-benefit analysis is only positive at the moment, actually, for the United States, right? Which, which did, uh, as, as you correctly said, replace so much of its... Um, uh, of its strategic competitor Russia but with its with its own goods right and let's also not forget that all of the aid that the United States give it's called aid right what is that aid it is US dollars that are created out of out of nothing through through the through an act of Congress <laughs> and then given to mostly US weapons suppliers right so this is yes. a direct injection of of finances into the US economy which then deliver finished goods. To Ukraine that then use them in order to try to kill as many Russians as they can while getting slaughtered themselves, right? This is why this the, the U.S. economy is also booming at the moment because yeah. this is Keynesianism, right? This is warfare Keynesianism. Um, yeah. So at the moment, the United States is actually winning quite a bit in terms of its of its of its productive capacity and uh, overall s- strategy. So is there? In terms of of coming to an end to the war, keeping this war going, and that's the argument of some of the YouTube commentators. It's the forever wars, right? The wars are not there to be won. The wars are there to be to be had to to feed the U- United States economy. Um, is there anything that would entice the United States realistically to come to an end? Maybe the the elections twenty twenty four. What could be an argument to tell the U.S. Look, we really really need to sit down with the Russians to come to an end of this. I don't see many ways of reaching the uh, likely candidates to emerge from the current electoral competition. If one looks at the Democratic side, one is pretty much left with uh, President Biden, who wants to run again. It would be a huge scandal if um, he were somehow ousted or decided to withdraw and replaced with someone else whose name we couldn't even guess at, at this point on the Democratic side. On the Republican side, all of the candidates with the exception of Vivek Ramaswamy uh, are for uh, an expansion of the United States military, uh, a more aggressive uh, global role in uh, being the world's policeman, and uh, funneling more money and resources into areas like Ukraine, the Middle East, and presumably elsewhere. So there's no, there's nothing new in that strategy. Whether Trump would do anything else, anything different, is of course sheer speculation. As is uh, whether he can even uh, be a candidate. The outsider candidate, Robert F. Kennedy Jr is more cautious and one might expect uh, a bit more restraint given his past rhetoric but he is very much a distant candidate right now Uh, so from among the main contenders we have um, all the the usual suspects who um, in who traditionally support um uh, an American imperial, uh, an imperial America, I would say, in world affairs. Um, so what what would change that? The only thing that has worked in the past, I think, to force, uh, create enough of a shock temporarily in the American elite to force a moment of pause and, re- and reflection 
is some sort of devastating consequence. In other words, I think, for example, of the tragic uh, deaths of, I think it was, uh, I don't know the number, but it was well over 100 Marines in Lebanon in an explosion. So sort of one event that, uh, that really brings home the possibility that wars have consequences also for Americans and also for American soldiers, not just for, for foreigners, that you can't simply throw money at the problem and expect uh, people to, to fight uh, on behalf of our ideals for, for that money. Um, and I don't know, you know, what, uh, what could, could cause that transformation. I think what is more likely is that Russia's strategy, which uh, gauging from the shift in rhetoric that has taken place over the last two months, uh, let's just assume that that rhetoric uh, arguing that Russia is now winning or is in, in the process of winning the, the war on its terms as a long-term uh, siege, essentially, of Ukraine, <clears throat> that if that strategy is correct, then the West will not so much abandon Ukraine. It will, however, effectively withdraw slowly, all the while declaring that it is not withdrawing. And we will simply see the resources being shifted to Ukraine gradually withering. Uh, and Ukraine, therefore, coming slowly and reluctantly, uh, Ukrainian leaders having to come slowly and reluctantly to the realization that they have been indeed deceived and abandoned by the West. But I think that that's, one, the most likely outcome and um, the one that I think uh, is currently being prepared for public consumption in the West. That's how I read the two major articles that have appeared recently, one in NBC News on uh, pressure uh, by France and Germany on Ukraine and possibly the United States also to, to begin negotiations. And then more recently along the same lines in uh, Bild Zeitung uh, on the secret plan that Scholz and uh, Biden are concocting uh, to, um, to give up on Ukraine. Now, do you think that um, looking at sorry, looking at the internal workings of Ukraine, that such a shift can take place under Zelensky? Because in your article you point out that maybe he he he's just not the one who who for for PR reasons can be negotiating with Putin, and there has to be a change. Um, maybe even through the, the elections and that there are preparations. And you mentioned that Solujny is, is one of the, might be one of the options of the people who might have the standing to, to negotiate. How, how do you, can, could you explain that? Or how do you see who internally of Ukraine, who realistically could sit down and undo 18 months of war propaganda that we will never negotiate? It's not the first time that Ukraine has faced this kind of dramatic shift. The latest uh, occurrence of this was the defeat of Poroshenko by Zelensky. Uh, and Poroshenko himself ran in 2015 as the peace candidate who, as he famously boasted, will reach a peace accord uh, uh, with Russia over Donbass within hours. Uh, that didn't turn out to be the case, and he became increasingly committed to a military solution. Similarly, having defined himself uh, as the war president, uh, Poroshenko, he was challenged on that by Zelensky, who said uh, a number of times that he would go on his knees to Moscow to negotiate an end to that conflict. Um, and has since uh, become uh, the president of this war. If the pattern holds true, we're likely to see the same thing 
uh, the same contraposition in the next round of candidates between, on the one hand, the established war president who has who can't run from his past rhetoric anymore. He has, uh, ever since the failure of the Istanbul Accords, uh, and he actually went further than that and signed uh, the National Security and Defense Council decree uh, prohibiting uh, the government from negotiating, the Ukrainian government from negotiating with Russia. He can't very well uh, easily turn, uh, sell himself as the peace candidate to the Ukrainian people. He can, however, um, step aside and allow others to step up and debate the various positions. We do not have a large number of candidates because, at least at this point, it seems unlikely that there will be elections under martial law, uh, as is currently the case. Uh, so what you have is um, just speculation about two people who might emerge as candidates among many more that we don't know. But these two are very different. So Alexey Aristovich is a, uh, a, 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 a television and radio personality who has uh, been what they call a political technologist in Ukraine for a number of years. And he has played all different sides on this issue. Uh, and most recently, however, uh, he moved from being in January an advisor to the president, speaking often on his behalf, interpreting uh, messages uh, for uh, the Ukrainian government, um, to uh, a very staunch critic of the current policies, both toward Russian speakers in Ukraine and toward uh, the possibility of achieving a peace with Russia, which he says is something that Ukraine desperately needs and should pursue first and foremost in order not to lose any more people and territory. It doesn't, in the conduct of this sort of negotiation and even a peace settlement, one doesn't necessarily, and he's quite right on this, he, one doesn't necessarily have to agree to the terms of the other side like giving up territory. You simply have to agree to disagree sometimes and not fight over it. So that's a, a compromise solution that is well known in diplomatic history. The other person who, of course, must be mentioned because uh, the conflict between the uh, commander of the armed forces and the president is now very obvious and has been mentioned uh, by many people uh, uh, around in the, in the office of the president. Uh, so Zelensky's conflict with uh, the commander of the armed forces, Zaluzhny, is such that given Zaluzhny's statement, it is clear that he does not see an actual military solution to this struggle. But, as the commander and as someone who has both the fighting experience and has commanded people in battle and knows the full scope of the resources that are available, he can argue for peace much more credibly than someone who does not have that experience. Of course, he's not the only one who could do that. One could name probably half a dozen popular commanders or people who are fighting at the front who might have who might have the same or very close to similar credentials and would be good um, spokesmen for a peace uh, initiative. One of those that really did surprise me because of his Russophobic stance for so long is the former Minister of Transportation, Omilian, who also seems now on some points to be very close, uh, now that he's a commander in the field, also very close to the position taken by Aris Aristovich. Um, other commentators on YouTube, especially Alexander um, Christoforu, he he calls Alec, uh, Arestovich the controlled opposition. You know, somebody that who's who's in the background because we have seen that real political enemies of Mr. Zelensky actually disappeared. Yeah. They were taken sure. away. So the ones that are still around are the ones that are 
not saying the same, but they are obviously being right. tolerated. Um, by a by the system by Zelensky himself, b by the by the extreme right wing for, forces, and c by the by the collective West, right? Who could at any point we know yes. change anyone? Yes. I mean, they can change a top pro, pro, uh, prosecutor even before the war, right? Uh, the the Biden family. Um, so these people are being kept around. Now, who do you think? is the most likely to gain the 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 approval of the west to maybe become the the the, the next leader of ukraine i'm uh, it would i i have no idea it's, it's sheer speculation um the only two names that have really surfaced are those of aristovich and zaluzhny uh, Aristovich mainly because of his own self-promotion more than anything else. I'm not sure he would do all that well in an actual electoral con contest. Zaluzhny probably would do well as war heroes uh, who retire, or especially if they're forced to retire, uh, do tend to do well, and they become critics of the, of the former political regime. But... Um, I'm not sure, the, the, uh, let me put it this way. I'm sure there are uh, groups in the West that do these analysis and that uh, speculate about who might emerge, who might not emerge. But this is very much pointless at this point because whoever emerges will take the public by storm and will essentially uh, be able to gain uh, power and popularity because of his populist rhetoric, not because of well thought out, carefully considered, tried and, and tested um, policies. It, 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 in this context, everything has failed. So it is the person who comes out with a dream for the future of Ukraine who will be the most successful. And that could be anybody. Okay. Uh, absolutely right. Now, let's suppose, let's suppose that something fantastic happens and we have a convergence of interests at the same time, that in Washington, in Kiev and in Moscow, uh, the people in power at the same time come to the conclusion for different reasons, it's now best to have a negotiated settlement, because you draw that out in your article. If that this convergence happens. What at the moment, as we stand on 28th of November, 2023, what would be a realistic negotiated end to, to, the, to the war, to the special military operation? The devil is obviously in the details. And I don't, uh, the suggestions that I made and, and which I also made in an earlier form in the national interest with my colleague Gilbert Doctorow about six or seven months ago as well, an earlier version of this, um, <clears throat> is to try to point out that although the rhetoric is extreme on both sides and dismissive of the opposition, when you actually see what was negotiated in Istanbul, um, you find that there are points of convergence. So there have been points of agreement and convergence in the past when the countries were already at war. And the question is, today, under the duress of one side predominating over the other, um, can those points of agreement be revived or how could they be modified for the present? There are always some necessary points of agreement. <clears throat> uh, and I point out uh, what, what they are, uh, at least three that I can think of. Um, one is that Russia and you, Russia and all countries want and Ukraine itself, want to be good neighbors with each other. I mean, that is the ultimate goal. They don't, that's not the case today, but it's very clear 
that if there is going to be peace and prosperity for any country in this region in the future, that is the ultimate objective. So the question is, how do we get there? Um, and uh, then we point out the differences in the objectives of the various sides as they stand now. Ukraine, and I point this out in my article, Ukraine wants to join NATO and the EU. Well, Russia, as Putin has mentioned within the last a month, quote, never objected to Ukraine joining the EU. This is important to point out because a lot of people uh, make the argument that he that Russia does object to Ukraine's membership in the EU. And uh, Putin has, says, has said clearly that it does not, but that Ukraine should not join NATO, and it sees the joining of the Ukraine joining any military alliance, especially one potentially directed against Russia, as um, as an existential threat to Russia. So uh, the objection is specifically to NATO membership. Why does Ukraine want NATO membership? Ukraine. Um, as has been often stated, there are a variety of reasons, but the one that is most often and consistently stated is security. In other words, what Ukraine wants is not specifically NATO membership. What it wants is security for itself. Well, that makes, again, that particular aspect of the negotiation a little simpler, because if a security guarantee can be offered, that would satisfy or be the equivalent satisfy Ukraine that it is the equivalent of a NATO of NATO membership. Then uh, there should be no uh, no real objection to substituting NATO membership, which has its own costs and burdens, and uh, frankly would not be easy uh, for the United for um, Ukraine to uh, finance even. Um, so to substitute it with some other guarantee uh, should be a workable compromise, I think. Um, the other two uh, problems are, uh, well, one is easier and the other is harder, I think. The easier one is giving up on the Ukrainian nationalist dream of a monolithic entity, uh, a monolithic nation speaking one language, basically thinking one thought as, as one unit. Uh, this is an old nationalistic dream, but it is really the ambition of a fairly small percentage of the population. If one takes into account, as I think Ukrainians will have to do, the loyalty to the state shown by Russian speakers who are uh, on the front lines, today fighting for the defense of their country, uh, if one takes that into account, then it would only be reasonable to assume that their, um, their culture and their willingness to defend Ukraine should be rewarded and recognized in some way and, not, and their identity not suppressed in a, a, a monocultural Ukraine. Uh, again, there are all of the preconditions for this in the current Ukrainian constitution and in all of the guarantees for minority rights that have been signed by independent Ukraine over the past 30 years. And the EU is obliged by its own covenants to support minority rights uh, in any member state and logically would have to support that ambition for Russian speakers in Ukraine as well. So I think that there's a, a possibility of, of arguing to the Ukrainian leadership that this is in their own best interest. The sticking point is really the restoration of the 1991 borders. Again, the problem here um, is ultimately that this decision to define as victory the retaking of all Ukrainian territory um, uh, up to the 1991 borders 
is a definition of the Zelensky government. A new government would presumably at least be willing to discuss this issue and to negotiate some status, uh, 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 some 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 pro, uh, interim status, perhaps with Russia uh, over the five ter- five regions that it has annexed. Uh, would Russia find this acceptable? We don't know. The the first indication, but I take it from an authoritative source, <clears throat> that Russia was indeed after the invasion, <clears throat> willing to discuss the status of, of, um, of these regions with the exception of Crimea, so four regions, including the Donbass, as, um, as, uh, as jointly owned, essentially, jointly supervised, was by Gerhard Schröder in his uh, long interview was it the Berliner Tageszeitung, I think, uh, that uh, he spoke to. And um, that is significant, although we must admit, and uh, this this is problematic, that the, annex, the incorporation of two of these regions into the Russian Federation in September of 2022, after the negotiations failed, of course, uh, make it difficult. But uh, difficult to negotiate some other status. However, negotiations exist uh, to lay all options on the table. And I would assume that all options are at least worth discussing. Yeah, and at some point, these discussions are important because we must not forget it is one thing to win a war. It's another thing to also win a peace. Uh, yes. It is very difficult, and we know that as as historians that uh, it happens more often than not that you come to an arrangement that will that will lay the foundations for a war ten, fifteen, twenty years ahead, right? And the cycle of violence just repeats. And I do not believe that something like that would be in the interest of Russia, right? You do not want a situation like the one between Palestine and Israel. Uh, right. over there right this is a worst case scenario where perpetual violence sure. becomes an innate part of the political system that's right but these sorts of divisions even let's the example of cyprus is an interesting one because we have northern cyprus which is um uh, i i um, i'm not sure what its status is but i think it is in any case, only recognized by Turkey. And uh, the rest of the island is recognized by the EU and other nations. Nevertheless, I was watching a video where some Spanish tourists literally just walked through the checkpoint (laughs) and were on on about their business uh, from Greek Cyprus to Turkish Cyprus and then returned... uh, the same way, without any impediments. So um, even though uh, countries are technically under one jurisdiction or another, doesn't mean that people can't live their lives often essentially uh, normally and with uh, full um, economic, with all the economic opportunities of investment uh, that you need for your children uh, and your yourself to to bring about prosperity for your family, uh, even though the political issues are not ultimately resolved. You're you're right. I mean, there there is an option in in for realistic reasons to to create de facto solutions without de jure. Uh, signatures on a piece of paper. We have such a case for the last 70 years in Taiwan, right? There's no more civil war between the two Chinas uh, because both of them agree we don't want to have a war and right. you don't have a solution, but there's no there's no war. We have a de facto mm. peace between North and South Korea and we have overlapping claims of on islands between Japan, yeah. Taiwan, uh, uh, Korea and, and, and China. Mm. And there is no fighting, even though there's no there's no there's no paper solution. The problem is that these things can blow up again, but they can actually bring. I mean, seventy years of peace is a good is a good amount of number years for peace. 
for for obvious reasons, there are big differences between the North Korean, South Korean example uh, and the Taiwan example or the Cyprus example. You really do want uh, to facilitate an exchange over the border right. as much as possible. Uh, and one of the things that I do propose, and perhaps it wasn't quite clear, uh, and when I when I reread it, I thought I should perhaps have been clearer <laughs> in saying that um, it's in one of the benefits of having some sort of international, uh, internationally sponsored joint administration of these territories is not only to pacify the antagonists, but also to elevate their status in international law to essentially what are zones of peace or free trade, where uh, the usual restrictions on trade that benefit perhaps not so much the region, but the central government are done away with precisely to bring an influx of funds into that region to really transform the Donbass uh, and south uh, southern regions of Ukraine from being a bulwark or a barrier between uh, the two halves of Europe, which I think does, in does include Russia, instead of being a bulwark, really a bridge between them. And to use it in very creative, to think of this region in very, very creative ways that might appeal to all the participants, Ukrainian, Russian, and locals as well. Yeah, I mean, imagine how beautiful it would be if these if these zones were allowed to trade with Ukraine and Russia while they sanction each other. I mean, they would benefit hugely and everybody else would benefit. It would be for everybody's best. The problem is that this kind of thinking is is what we do who are interested in people's goods. But there is an, an, a significant number of people, the neocons especially, who are, who are in zero-sum game. Therefore, anything that's good for the other party is bad for me. And they will always try to, to you know, to just win by making the other one lose so i would hope that this that these ideas of yours get more prevalent well the, what you said a wonderful idea it reminds me of um an obituary that i wrote on the passing of sergei sivoko i call it the last ukrainian peacemaker and uh, that was his dream literally he said he doesn't like to use the term line of uh, line of confrontation or line of separation. He says he calls it a line of contact because this is where people at this line should get together and talk to each other. Instead of shooting at each other. Yeah. 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 Nikolai Petro, I would like to thank you very much for an insightful talk. Thank you, Pascal. Till the next, till we meet again. <laughs>